My name is Brian Gomez. I'm the chair-elect here for New Mexico uh, College Access Council. Really excited for everyone being here for our special tea event. Um, I want to make sure you guys all know the rules of engagement. Uh, please uh, make sure to have yourself muted as well as if you like, you keep your um, camera off. There's no requirement for that. But if you have any questions as we go into the presentation here, uh, make sure to leave it on the chat and we'll answer them as soon as possible. Uh, so to begin, we would like to introduce Liz Vijo here from NMSU. Um, Liz is originally from West Texas and passionate about breaking down barriers for access to education for historically underrepresented populations. Her educational background is in cultural anthropology and educational leadership, and she's worked with various universities and companies, including the Walt Disney Company in Orlando, Florida. In higher education, Liz has worked with accreditations for athletics, financial aid, and is currently the family outreach specialist with undergraduate admissions and orientation at New Mexico State University. So to get us started, I'd like to welcome everyone here and to Liz Beagle. Yeah, thanks, Bryant, for that lovely introduction. Um, I actually joked with Bryant that having a bio read makes me feel like I'm in a pageant or something, and I should be walking the stage waving it while it's read. But thank you all again for joining us today from wherever you are, uh, whether it's your home, your office, your car, or maybe even your bedroom. I'm happy to be coming to you live from my dining room, although it might look like I'm floating above NMSU's campus right now. Um, but nevertheless, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So. Family matters, right? A journey to student success. Prepping for your student to apply to or leave for college has definitely never been a walk in the park by any means, but this year especially, it's coming with some added stresses and worries, I'm sure. And before we even begin, I'd like to invite you to participate in a poll that's gonna pop up in the middle of your screen. Um, uh, what level of experience are you coming from? Is this your first? second, third student. Um, there is an option for first generation families, which means that the student's parents didn't obtain a four-year degree. But if you can participate in that poll, I would really love to know who's in the audience with us today. I'll give everybody a few moments on that. All right, so the majority of you, and we do have a smaller group today, um, the majority of you, this is your first student to attend college. Um, and then some of you, second and more than two students sent off to college. That is amazing. But whatever experience level you're coming from, we are so, so aware that every new journey with each student is a brand new experience, right? It comes with new challenges. It comes with a different student um, and different needs and different universities for a lot of the parts. So I really hope that um, everybody, no matter what your experience level is, you get um, information out of this that's useful for you. And so just for reference for the presentation, you're gonna hear me say students rather than children because I and my programs recognize the diversity of family structures and support systems. And that means that it might not be your child, it might be your niece, your cousin, your sibling, or even your friend. Um, that you're here to support and we definitely welcome all members of our student support systems. All right. So what are, so does family support really matter? So short answer is yes. Obviously, otherwise, what are we doing in the Zoom call right now, right? There would be no reason for me to have the job that I have, but long answer is we need to talk about number one, why it matters, and number two, more specifically, what type of involvement matters. All right, I'm gonna switch it up and talk a little bit about what kind of involvement matters right now first. And so let's define the term support. There's gonna be two types of support that we like to talk about, instrumental and emotional. And so instrumental support is tangible. You can see it, it's something that's physically done. Maybe you yourself have gotten your degree and you're giving the student information, you're filling things out for them, that's instrumental support. They see you as a resource for information. Um, emotional support is exactly what it sounds like. You ask them how they're doing, you prep them for college stress and homesickness, life changes, identity crises, all of that. And then when they're finally enrolled in a university or college, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, you're there to build them up. You're interested in their life changes, whether it's accomplishments or challenges, you're there to help them work through all of that, right? So when we talk about support, we're gonna talk about those two different kinds of support. So right now as your student, right? They're searching, they're choosing a university or a college. They're searching for the fit that they want. 
in that university or college. And there's a specific way that I'm gonna recommend for you to be involved. And there's so many parenting style terms or support style terms, right? Because this goes for anybody who's helping students out. And we could talk about all of them, but we're definitely past the days of helicopter parents, which I'm sure that everybody has heard of, knows about. And we've moved to Black Hawk and Bulldozer parenting or supporting. And so that means you're basically telling the student, you do not know what you're doing. I'm gonna do everything. I'm just gonna go right in there and take care of all of it. Destroy it for you, right? You don't have to worry about anything. But step one really comes with allowing your student to take ownership over their application process and their search process in a sense. So I promise you that this is important because the precedent that you set now for them handling things or for you handling things for them is what they're gonna to continue to expect in the future. So if right now you're the one choosing the schools they're applying to, you're submitting everything for them, you're writing things for them, you're emailing the school pretending to be them, trust that happens, uh, you're putting your info on everything, right? Your email address, your phone number, everything. You're not giving them the necessary responsibility over the process for them to feel invested in it. And I know that all of that is well-meaning, right? I've worked with families a lot. And so, you know, if you let them do all of it themselves, or maybe you feel this way, that they're gonna miss deadlines. They're not gonna ask the right questions or they're gonna put wrong information. But this is that space where we really want you to begin to develop a partnership or you become their consultant on these things, right? We want you to help them figure out what factors are for this school being the right fit for them. So students and families, whoever I talk to, right, because I've worked with both students and families in multiple spaces, we tend to focus only either on the social aspects, right, the, the personal, emotional um, growth that's going to happen, what kind of clubs, what kind of organizations, what kind of social life, who's going there, friends, anything like that, or we only focus on the academic aspects. But you need both of them, right? Does it have the degree program they want and the right space for them to learn to develop into their future career? But is it also the right fit for them to be comfortable in the level of personal growth that they're going to obtain in the four to six years that they might be there? So in no way am I suggesting that you should totally be hands off, but definitely work with what's best for your student, right? So some may need you to help them narrow down their list of choices to apply to. Some might need you to give them helpful nudges that deadlines are approaching, or maybe you'll just be a safety net at the end to proofread things, to make sure that things have been turned in, um, and just to remind them. Or maybe you might even just be their cheerleader and they've got it all in control. But whatever works is good for your student, but definitely giving them some of that responsibility which requires them to fully invest in it and begin to see the seriousness of it, right? Because the journey into higher education is a big, big, massive undertaking, right? I, I think a lot of our students um, tend to get their perceptions and their ideas of what higher education should look like from popular culture, from popular media, right? And so sometimes it just looks as easy as, oh, I just submit an essay and then I go and there's my first day of class, but that's absolutely not it. There is an entire um, slew of requirements and information that they need to send and get from the institution and it can become a whole mess, right? So we want your student in this space to learn to develop that connection with the institution, to learn to communicate with that institution that they're eventually gonna be a part of and know that they can ask for help and can communicate effectively because they're gonna be thrust into that fully when they do begin their classes. But this is one most important step, um, giving your student a chance to begin to feel responsible for what they're doing so that carries over into this new space and this new experience. So why does your involvement matter? Sometimes I ask, and I've even titled my orientation sessions for families as they're ready, are you, right? And it's even the title of a popular book um, about the transition for family members. Um, but in reality, at this point, 75% of your students are so not ready, but you can definitely help them get there. 
and crafting a great communication plan and starting the foundation for how you can support your student while they're actually in their higher education journey starts now. So the actions you take and the level of support you begin giving now make a lasting impact. And that's why in the last slide I talked about starting it off with these actions for the search and application process. And so right now it's worth taking a minute to talk about the generational characteristics of your student, right? So they are different, very, very different than those that come before them. And so Generation Z is what your students are a part of. They are born or part of the group that's born from 1995 to 2012. I know that the media likes to group them in with millennials, but they are definitely their own um, branch of students. And so when they're looking at their potential college experience, we know that they want meaningful face to face interactions, right? Social experiences matter to them. And believe it or not, they're really, really concerned about work and the type of work that they're, they're going to do in the future. They were born into a recession. They're worried about their finances and they're worried about how they're going to be prepared to enter the workforce. So I joke with students sometimes that I've seen the memes that they post right where they talk about how employers want 15 years worth of experience right out of college with a college degree right there's no way that's possible but these are real fears that they have about whether they're going to be able to find a job they're frugal, they're career driven, they're worried about student loans and debt, and they're concerned with how that future work is actually gonna balance with their life and lifestyle, right? And so with that, more than any other generation before them, feedback and connection is critical to them. They wanna hear how they're doing, they want updates on their applications, they want updates on their grades in class, they wanna be checked in with frequently, they wanna know what's going on because they're so used to having information in the palm of their hands, right? Anything they need to know, they're just gonna Google it right away. Um, it's not like me when I was in high school and you actually have to go to the library and look up through all of the many, many um, informational books, right? I can't even remember what they're called anymore. That dates me so, so fiercely. Um, but Generation Z with that too, what's great about it is they fully welcome their family support and engagement more than any, any other group before them, even when they pretend like they don't. And so family support and encouragement, we understand are critical to our students developing resilience and a sense of purpose. And so I'll give you some fast facts about our current college students from Gen Z regarding communication. Um, so research shows that family members and students both evenly split the level of communication they have once a student is in college. And so students who identify as male on average speak with their families or parents 11.3 times a week. And those that identify as female speak with them about 14.5 times a week. And so 75% of students in this study felt like they were satisfied with how much they talked to their families, but the other 25% wanted more communication. 70% of those family members or parents were satisfied and did not want any more additional contact. And so hopefully that makes you feel a little calmer about your student potentially going away for school or even if they're staying home right that that relationship changes know that they're still going to want to talk to you and that's why your support matters so much they're going to you first before anything else so it's time to talk there's going to be a few conversations that might be helpful for you and your student to have and I'm not gonna to touch on the financial aid process or how it works, but what's important to me to talk about is the communication about money and monetary factors that play into your student's ability to make smart money decisions, as well as allow them to be proactive and in control in the financing of their education and ultimately their future. And I know this can sometimes be a cultural issue of respect where maybe we don't talk about finances or just in your tradition, in your family, it's just not something you're used to doing. But this plays a large role in not only the decision of where to go to college, but also how, how and if your student can continue on once they're there. Uh, when I worked in financial aid, I had a lot of students that would try to get their FAFSAs done but they didn't have access to that information or their parents didn't want to give it to them. And while that's a whole nother ball game, um, know that your student, if you are their biological parent, they're going to need your tax information until they turn 24. 
Um, and I know that seems very far off and most of them will finish their degrees by the time they turn that age. And there's some other excluding factors, but for 95% of your students, that information is necessary for federal funding. And so you'll want to talk to a current financial aid professional should you have any other issues or concerns about that because things change so quickly over there and it's been a mile since I've been there. Um, but as of right now, as you're planning, your students should understand that they're going to have a bill to pay, right? And they're going to have additional expenses, not only from school in terms of books and um, materials, backpack, paper, printer, whatever, right? They're also going to have expenses if they're living on campus or off campus, right? Because they're gonna want snacks, they're gonna need toilet paper, they're gonna need personal items. And so teaching them about smart money management is important. The hard part about this sometimes is that the word budget can be so off-putting, right? Because it very much sounds like, I wanna control what you're doing and how you're doing it. And that's really touchy subject when it comes to money. But a college education is such an investment, right? four to six years or maybe it's two right maybe your student did early college or maybe they're going to go for their um, associates at a community college before it's still a really big investment and we need to talk finances um, the college experience one thing that my thing about financial aid and financing your education whether it's through scholarships federal aid um, whether it's anything right the college experience is absolutely fantastic but it doesn't happen if it can't be paid for, right? So whether your student needs to work and buckle down and apply for more scholarships, whether they need to get their FAFSA in line, whatever they need to do, financing and family discussions about how it's gonna be financed are really, really important and crucial because one of the number one reasons that I had students leave in the, our institution after their first semester is because of unpaid bills and they could no longer register for classes or they couldn't afford another semester. And so this is super important for the longevity of your students staying at an institution that they understand budgeting and how financing looks for their education. All right, so what are the rest of the steps? I gave you one step earlier, which was to let your student take some ownership over the application process. But what are some other steps you can take or talk about? So jumping to step two, we've gone through the application process, right? Here come acceptance letters or maybe some denials, right? And so deal with the denials how you see fit, especially if it was one of their top choices that might be a really big blow to their self-esteem. But with acceptances, maybe there's a whole slew of them, right? Help them make a pros and cons list. One factor, right, so we talked about them picking the schools that they want to go to based off of multiple factors, right, both academic and social. And so one factor that they've been accepted to is not enough to say, yes, I want to spend the next four to six years here. And definitely, and I will be very candid and say definitely it should not be going to school with best friend or significant others because while it may last forever in their teenage hearts, um, we know that these things can sometimes be fleeting. and I tell everyone, whether it is staff or my students that I, that I work with currently, um, they need to be loyal to themselves before anybody else. And so they need to put themselves in the best position at an institution for their future before anything else, right? Put themselves in the best position and everything else will come with it. Um, and they definitely, when they're making this decision, right, you're, you're being their sounding board, their consultant, they're saying, I don't know if I wanna go here, this school has this, but this school has this, and what do I do? Um, they don't have to make the decision by themselves because that's a pretty hefty decision. I feel like students are like, oh my God, I'm, I'm deciding the rest of my life right now at this point, right? This is a family journey in a sense. So while you shouldn't be offended if they do make the decision on their own, be there for them. Um, I'm sure you want to be a part of this process, right? Don't tell them where to go, but be that consultant. Say, well, let's look at this option and what about this option? And then hopefully they'll be able to choose one from there. Um, hopefully you also get to sport some swag colors from your institution that you're really comfortable wearing. And if not, I'm so sorry. Um, but other than that, step three. So when they do decide, help them make a to-do list of everything they need and want to do. So what's a bucket list for the summer? Whether they're staying local, right, or not. Um, maybe they have some friends leaving. Um, they may have things that they want to buy and do. 
especially as seniors in high school, it all wraps up so fast. And right now, right, we're in an online environment. They may be struggling to feel fulfilled. Maybe they're um, not going to get what they expected in homecomings and um, graduations and proms and all those kind of things. But I always encourage students and their families to make the most of even the smallest socially distant opportunities that are out there, right? So whether it's connecting with friends um, through a Zoom party or something, just making sure that they have some loose ends tied up before they leave or before they start their college education. And so step four, help them prepare for the transition into early adulthood, right? So this is really what it is. And so that's also why I stray from calling them children because they're basically stepping foot into early adulthood, even if they're staying with you um, in your home, it's a big transition. They're, they've get, they are given new responsibilities, new spaces where they've never felt like they've had a voice before. It's now thrust upon them, right? And so while I don't expect you to give them a whole crash course on what it means to be an adult and how to find your voice, um, simple things, you know, when I first moved out of my parents' home, I don't know how many times I called my mother to ask how to make rice, but every single time she either answered the phone or texted and gave me the recipe or instructions. And so there are things that they're going to forget and maybe need to know in the moment and they're going to call you, right? But prepping them with maybe how to do laundry, how to sort colors, um, how to cook some of their favorite things how to ask for help. And so that's a big one. And I wanna take a moment to talk about that a little bit. So like I said that the word budget can be seen as an off-putting word or a dirty word, um, the word help is very much so seen as something by students um, from all walks of life, right? As something negative. They don't want to ask for help. And so I can speak to that. I was one of those students, right? I was a first generation college student and my family for me was emotional support. They could not provide me instrumental support because neither of my parents went to college, had a college degree, so they couldn't help me figure out how to talk to um, the registrar's office, how to figure things out with the bursar's office or the financial aid and university university accounts receivable office, whatever the office may be called. And so I didn't want anybody to know that I didn't know what I was doing. And so I never asked for help. Um, and so I never want students to feel like that same way that I did. And so we want our students and not only our students, but families to know too, that asking for help doesn't mean that you don't belong somewhere, right? If you don't know how to do something, that's why you're in school to learn to do things, right? doesn't make you dumb. I feel like a lot of students tell me, oh, it's such a dumb question. And I have family members email me too or call me. They're like, I'm so sorry. This is such a dumb question. And it's never a dumb question. Um, the journey into higher education and through it and out of it, even when students are doctoral students, it's a massive undertaking, not only financially, but emotionally, socially, personally, right? And so the reason offices like mine and student resources all across campuses, right, whether it's mine or any other institution, exist is because students and families are supposed to need help. And so there's no way that you or your student can do this on your own and you shouldn't have to, right? So encourage your students to seek support from different spaces, wherever they need it on campus, right? Um, it's just, it's something I'm so, so passionate about. Just ask for assistance, ask for help. We literally get paid to do this. So please, whether it's now in this perspective area, right? Feel free to ask questions. You don't know what's going on. You're not sure what's going on. Reach out to whether it's your admissions advisor, whether it is the admissions office, right? Whether it's the department that you're trying to go into, reach out to the financial aid office. Um, when I worked in financial aid, we always loved to see students who were on the ball and ready to go even a year in advance, you know? Um, we are happy to help you Anybody at institutions are very, very happy to help you get set into what you need to go, right? So problems happen when we wait and things are done at the last second and then we try to play catch up. If you have everything ready to go before, you're asking questions before as much as possible, it really, really sets you up for, for 
a good space to be for your education. All right, so family orientations. Um, if the institution that your student ends up at has a parent or family orientation, I highly, highly recommend that you intend, you attend it, or you intend to attend it, right? Um, things to keep in mind are at most of these institutions, you are going to be separate from your student for the majority of the orientation program. Um, for some orientations at different institutions, student and family orientations are at different times. Um, you're really just going to have to either seek out information on the institution's website, which you can already see now based off of past years or this past year, because for us, we just wrapped up our orientation sessions a month ago. And so most institutions are like that as well. And so um, you can also see what it looks like when your student registers for their orientation programming, right? This is super important. And I'll tell you, as orientation professionals, and I run our orientation for um, our institution for our families, we are not trying to get you away from your student to try and trick them into doing things. And your student is not just kind of having a ball, even though it might look like it, right? We're really good at making it look like they're just having a ball in their introduction to the institution. But it's really an opportunity for your students to begin to develop more of those help-seeking behaviors, assistance-seeking behaviors, to feel comfortable being themselves, because while I don't want to say your student does not feel comfortable being themselves in front of you, uh, we all know when we were at that age that we did not feel comfortable being ourselves in front of our parents sometimes, or our system of support, right, any adult in our life. And so this really gives them that space to meet new people, to um, experience ideas that they never had before, even before they begin their classes at the institution. And so this also gives them the space to ask the questions that they may be fearful or uncomfortable asking in front of you, right? And so I know that um, even though I was a first gen student, right? If I was gonna ask a question, I would never wanna do it in front of my mom. She'd be like, you didn't ask it properly. Um, and so this is a space for them to do that. <clears throat> and at your own orientation programming, right? For families. And so we did this all virtually this year and um, that is your opportunity to dominate the floor with questions you have to ease your mind, right? Which are very different from your students. Your students are asking, what professor should I take? And where can I find the best places to lock up my bike on campus? And what's good to eat? Like, those are things that are important to your student. Um, but generally, when I'm talking to families, they're talking about campus safety and billing and financial aid and all of those questions. And so when you are together with your student, a lot of the times families are dominating those um, question and answer sessions. And we wanna give you both the equal space and opportunity to ask your own questions. Um, but so too, can you use this space to build connections with others? Because the only people who really understand what family members who are sending off a student into higher education are going through are gonna be other family members that walk that walk with you, especially this specific year, right? So even for those of you who have sent multiple students off these couple years, this last summer and this next summer, we are kind of in flux, you know? And thank you for your patience with all institutions. I'll say this for all institutions. Thank you for your patience because we are rolling with the punches and, and doing our best to keep you all communicated with. And we are so happy that your students are going to be emerging into our institutions and we can't wait to see them. And so um, in my sessions this summer, even virtually, right, over Zoom, I had families that were cross country exchanging information because it was one student's family was from Washington. And so a student's family who was local in Las Cruces would offer to be that student's safe space or that family member's contact when they couldn't get in touch with the student and be able to check in on them locally. And so those are definitely the kinds of things that family orientations and family groups allow you to do and we also formed support groups of people who realized they were from the same area and sending a student off and now they're gonna go get coffee. And it was so great. And I encourage you to use these spaces to do that as well. All right, so eventually they're at an institution. Now what? What happens to you? So this is where that emotional support really needs to come in at. Your student is going to experience an entire mass of changes, right? Whether it is in person, whether it's online, whether they're living on campus, whether they're living off campus, 
they are off of a strict schedule, right, of eight to four classes or whatever they might be doing right now, it's very different. It's a different level of expectation, right? It's different offices they need to take care of. They're used to maybe a counselor doing everything for them or just all of their teachers getting together and doing everything for them. They're used to teachers saying, hey, where's your homework? Why didn't you do this? Oh, here's another chance to do this. And sometimes that doesn't happen at the level of higher education. And so they might need a little extra support checking in not only with how their class is, right? So we don't want every call or conversation that you have with them, like, how are your grades? How are you doing? How's your homework? Did you do your homework? We don't want you to have conversations with your student like that. Um, we know they're going to happen, but we definitely want you to be checking in on them on their emotional support, right? Especially right now, um, some advice that I gave to our family members this summer is, you know, a lot of their students were grieving the loss of the end of their senior year that they expected. And so definitely as they're stepping foot into a new space where they're really uncertain about what's happening, um, they need that extra support too, emotionally. How are you doing? What's going on? Maybe you should go see the counseling services on campus and talk to somebody. Because one thing that we can model for our students is great mental health, being in touch with how we are, right? So we talk about wellness and we're like, eat well, drink water, do all those things. But when we want to be fully healthy, we also want to make sure we're emotionally and mentally healthy as well. And nine times out of 10, it's part of their student fees for free sessions at their counseling services. It is at our institution. And so we definitely want them to take advantage of that as well. And so when it comes to instrumental support at this point, right, so you've prepped them, you've given them that information, you want to defer to institutional resources as much as possible. If they're telling you, well, I can't figure out what my financial aid is and this and that, and rather than you having to figure that out for them, tell them, go talk to your financial aid advisor. You need help with your paper, go to tutoring, go to the writing center, go talk to somebody, right? Because your student really needs to create that connection with the university, plus they're paying for all of those services, right? So we want them to make use of them. Um, know the limits of FERPA. So FERPA is um, a federal guideline that protects student information, right? And so in the realm of higher education, this means that once your student is a student of a higher education institution, that institution and its offices can only talk to the student about their information. So if you as a family member are trying to call financial aid, billing, their academic advisor or anything like that, nobody will give you information, right? That is just how it is. Um, there are ways around that at most institutions, if not all through proxy access, right? Where your student can sign a waiver, but there are gonna be limits for how much information and how much you can personally do for your student. And so that's really also why we wanna set them up with great behaviors of help seeking and assistance seeking so that they can do it on their own rather than you having to come in and be their superhero every time and call the office for them. So get involved with parent and or family programs on campus. Most institutions have a parent or family um, option for programs. Um, it's a great way to redirect your energy, right? So maybe you're so used to having your student in your life that you just have all this extra energy afterwards. Give back to the institution, right? We love having family members who they are empty nesters. And I'm like, please call me. I will use you for panels and I will use you to um, create connections with other family members who are feeling a little lost to mentor other families, right? Um, and so also in that too, create regional support groups with people that you meet because maybe you're all empty nesters and now you don't know what to do, get together and find something to do that'll take up that time, right? And also celebrate, right? So a lot of the time we focus on, oh, this is gonna be so hard. This is just, um, there's so many challenges that we're experiencing, but also celebrate. You have something to celebrate yourself for helping your student get to this point, right? There's so much work that you as a family or support member need to put into this to help your student. Oh, please celebrate when you finally get them there. That is a big accomplishment. But definitely also feel all those emotions you're gonna feel in this transition, whether it's sad, whether it's excited, whether it's fear, anything like that. Recognize that all of those emotions are gonna come with this because this is a really big transition, not only for your student, but for yourself as well. And just as we close out, a couple tips for success that I'm gonna recommend. So I recommend that you lead by example, right? <clears throat> Especially right now. 
our students take cues from us um, on our attitudes about situations. So students can be like, well, I don't know if I want to go. And I don't know, there's just so much online. It doesn't, this is the reality right now. I'll just be very frank. Um, Brian and I were talking about this earlier. It's the reality right now. And so they can continue to wait, but we don't know what the future looks like, right? And there's no way for us to predict that. And so they can either run with it and make the best out of it and make it their generational story, right? So there's, we always hear about like grandparents and my mom, um, she was born in the fifties. And so she tells me, oh, oh, I had to take my shoes off right as soon as I got home from school. And if I wanted to go to the store to buy bread, I had to go without shoes on because those are my school shoes, right? And so this is this generation's story. I had to start school online, right? So we don't know if your student will for um, the years that are coming up, but this generation, they're gonna have this story. And so they can really lean into this narrative or they can be scared and fearful of it. Um, but making the best out of that situation, they really will take cues from us on our attitude about it. So again, in encourage your students to be proactive. Getting things done early is crucial to their success because getting things done early leaves time for hiccups, right? For problems, for issues to come. And then we also have time to take care of that. If we're getting things done at the last minute, then we don't have time for potential hiccups. And so always leave room for some hiccups. Um, again, teach them everything you can about being an adult as much as possible before they make this new step. For yourself, start building your own network of support systems, whether it is your local people who also have students in college at other institutions, or maybe you meet some at this new institution, right, for there, maybe there's a group for prospective families or a way for you to get connected as prospective families. Um, and it's going to help ease your transition as well. Pick up a few parent guides for reading. So I have a few here, happy to recommend if you reach out to me. There are books all over the place. This one's called Don't Tell Me What To Do, Just Send Money. They're funny, um, but they can help you, right? So there are nuances of every student's experience that's gonna be different, but these are general um, and will help you out tremendously to navigate some of these experiences. So connect with me. Um, this is my information. I am housed at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, but you can email at families at nmsu.edu. Um, connect with me and I am happy to help you out in any way that I can.